Thank you very much, Leslie, for that introduction. Um, so, Leslie mentioned that I'm from the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington. There's five volcano observatories in the U.S. Geological Survey. The Volcano Observatory in Vancouver was formed after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens for the purpose of monitoring that volcano, but eventually for monitoring all the Cascades volcanoes. My, we received during such an eruption, we decided if we didn't answer that question, somebody else probably would. And in fact, people have tried, at least speculated. You can go to Google, uh, you can type Yellowstone super eruption in Google images and come up with all sorts of um, images of what an erup a super eruption might look like at Yellowstone. Most of these are very fanciful. And, but there's plenty of speculation out there, like Sakurajima volcano in Japan, or a set, uh, or Stromboli volcano in Italy, and even Etna volcano, which is here at the in uh, uh, in Sicily at the south end of Italy, erupt monthly. Many erupt daily, and these they produce single explosions that just expel tens of cubic meters of lava. But this one particular eruption that I'm showing in this photo occurred in 2001. It had a three kilometer plume height. It lasted for about five days. It uh, produced a deposit on the east side that was mapped. So the way that we estimate how much uh, tephra or lava or magma has come out of a volcano during an eruption is that we go out to specific field locations. If it's a tephra deposit, we'll actually me uh, measure the thickness at those locations, or even the mass per unit area, where you actually collect a sample and weigh it, knowing exactly what area it came from on the ground surface. And then you integrate over that area, and you make a, a, an estimate of the total volume. So the total volume of this eruption was pretty small, 90,000 cubic meters. If you took a sphere with that volume, it would be about 60 meters in diameter, so it would pretty much fit very comfortably within the this memo. Park USGS complex. <laughs> Not a very big eruption. Um, so let's go to something a little bit bigger. So this is the eruption of Dayafjallajökull in Iceland. This is the eruption that occurred in April and May of 2010. It was the eruption that notoriously shut down European airspace for a week. It caused about five million dollars in economic loss because people couldn't travel that time. It actually started as a, um, a lava fountain eruption on the flank of the volcano. In the background, it would be back where this ash cloud is, there was, were lava fountains that uh, there were spectacular at night. People would fly over them in helicopters. Hmm. And that went on throughout for a couple of weeks in March. Then that eruption stopped. The magma drain, it re-entered the system and intersected a more evolved magma body underneath the summit. And then a new eruption started on the 14th of April. This eruption um, went on for about five or six days from the 14th to the 18th of April. This is the one that sent the ash cloud to Europe that stopped up the air traffic. The regulators uh, had an emergency meeting at the end of this week to try to figure out how to get air uh, that get flights moving again, and they eventually decided that they would allow flights through the blue ash. So they had to decide what was blue ash. How do you know how much is that ash is in the air? They went back to the modelers and said, give us concentration charts that tell us how much ash is in the air so we can fly around the concentrated parts of the cloud. And this has been a, a change in the rules that we've still been living with ever since then. It's put a lot of new wait on the modelers to get their models right. This is a bit of a side story, but the bottom line is that during this eruption, it was actually a fairly small eruption. It was a two to seven kilometer plume height, but it went on for weeks. And that was part of the reason it caused so much, much disruption. The total volume, once it was, it was mapped and integrated, was about two tenths of a cubic kilometer. So hundreds of times bigger than it had started. In, on uh, March 20th of 1980 as a series of earthquakes that eventually developed into steam explosions that were at the summit. But over the period from 
March 27th until May 18th, there was an intrusion that intruded magma into the center of the volcano and pushed the north flank out. Uh, at one point, they were putting reflectors on the north flank of the volcano and measuring the distance between those reflectors and the observation post on the north side and measuring rates of movement that were meters per day. It was a very rapid rate of movement. And it became quite obvious by late April that the north flank was being un becoming unstable. And finally, on May 18th at 8.32 in the morning, a magnitude 5.2 earthquake shook the north side of the mountain down and produced the largest landslide in recorded history. It, this is basically, you can see this, this was, it was an amazing coincidence. Gary Rosenquist was standing northeast of the volcano having his morning coffee at the time that he took these pictures. And so you can see these, the, the mountain sliding away and intersecting the magma body that had intruded. The magma body, which was saturated in gas, expanded out as the gas um, expanded and, and then went northward as a lateral blast that eventually engulfed air and the mixture was hot enough to, to, to rise buoyantly. So there were pictures showing this northward moving lateral blast that, that rose buoyantly as an umbrella cloud. And we could see these in satellite images. This is the, the summit of Mount St. Helens. The umbrella cloud rose from a point about 15 kilometers north of the volcano. And, um, sorry, just to go back there. So it spread out from about 8.30 in the morning to sometime after 9. This, this satellite image was taken at 9.20. But after that time, activity really began at the summit. So a vertical column of ash and gas rose from the vent at the summit to about 15 kilometers, well, between 13 and 17, for about nine hours, from about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It distributed ash across central Washington, Idaho, Montana, and <clears throat> When they, when they mapped that deposit, they came out with about a 0.2 cubic kilometer uh, erupted volume for the magma. So it was actually similar to Eiffel-Yokut, except it occurred all over nine hours rather than three weeks. So it was a much more intense event. It was also one of the best studied events in the world up to that time. It still is actually one of the best studied events in the world up, uh, as it they occur less and less frequently around the world. So of EEI-5, the size of the Mount St. Helens eruption, occurs about once per decade somewhere around the world. If we go to a EEI-6, the size of Pinatubo, those occur maybe a few times per century. And a EEI-8, which is the size of Yellowstone, less than once per 10,000 years, probably more likely once every about 100,000 years somewhere around the world. So these are very, very big events. I mentioned earlier, the plume height is an indication of the eruption size, really the rate of, of the eruption. You can see, I, so I plotted here the height of these plumes of the eruptions that I've talked about so far. Etna, which went up to about three kilometers. Eiffel-Yokut, which went to six or seven. The two phases of the Mount St. Helens eruption, which rose to 30 kilometers initially during the first half hour and then 15 during later periods. And then Pinatubo, which rose up to almost 40. And these big eruptions can get into the stratosphere, which is, starts between about 12 and 18 kilometers elevation. And they can go much higher than airplanes fly. So if you were in a, in a plane flying at jet cruise altitude, which is roughly about 10 kilometers, and a Pinotubo cloud erupted, and you were trying to see the top of it, it would be almost like you were on the ground. That's how much higher it is than where, than where jets fly. They're, jets typically fly at 10 kilometers. These are 40 kilometer high plumes. So they are towering plumes. But the interesting thing, and, and really the thing that I want to point out in this talk, is that once you get to these really big eruptions, say Pinatubo size and larger, or even Mount St. Helens size and larger, uh, what really becomes important is the umbrella cloud. So we have, here's an example of the Eiffel-Yokut eruption where you have, we're looking down from space. You can see the eruptions coming out from here and, and the ash cloud is moving gradually downwind past 
passively in the wind field, and the plume is getting gradually wider as it get, goes downwind. These bigger eruptions were forming these umbrella clouds that are actually pushing their way upwind. And if we uh, replot the plot that I showed you in the previous slide, so that the vertical and horizontal scales are the same, what you see is if we have the wind direction going this way, that these Mount St. Helens and Pinatubo size eruptions can really push their way a long distance upwind. The reason is because these things are rising buoyantly until a point where they have reached a neutral buoyancy. So their buoyancy is the same as the surrounding atmosphere, but they still have upward momentum. So they keep going, and then, and then they eventually lose their upward momentum and find that they're denser than the atmosphere and fall back to a lower elevation. It's like a fountain, basically. They fall back to a lower elevation, not to the ground surface, but to some elevation higher, and then they spread out. And so these are essentially gravity currents that are spreading out laterally. We don't know exactly how long they lasted. It was probably days at most weeks. Uh, so these are, these are the Yellowstone eruptions, Long Valley, and then again, Pinatubo for scale. The only known larger, known larger eruption in the last two million years, other than these Yellowstone eruptions, was the Tobo eruption, which occurred in Indonesia 75,000 years ago. Okay, so um, we do know that there were uh, there was tephra that would fell out of the atmosphere during these eruptions. We actually have maps uh, showing us where these deposits have uh, have been noted, and some of the a, a more modern map than these uh, notes that there have actually found deposits from these Yellowstone major eruptions as far west as California, and even offshore of Oregon, a deep sea drill core has found them. And this is especially noteworthy because it's pretty far upwind. We know that during most of the last million years, the wind has, has been mostly from the west across the continent. And exactly how you move ash that far upwind has been a bit of a puzzle to people. So these, are, uh, these deposits are known throughout much of the Midwest um, in places they've been mined for abrasives. In places they're up to a couple of meters thick in Kansas, but we think that that's not an original thickness. It was probably uh, reworked by wind and water to, uh, to those thicknesses and probably removed from other areas. Um, okay, so how, how thick do we think the original thickness was? And again, there's these speculations online in the column of cells above the volcano, we simply add ash and distribute the mass in that column according to some formula. And, and then we calculate through a series of time steps, we calculate how that ash moved downwind in an existing wind field and how it settles gravitationally out of the, out of the atmosphere. Um, so the, the kinds of inputs that we use are the plume height, the, how long the eruption lasts, the size distribution of the grains, because the fine grains settle more slowly in the atmosphere than coarse ones. Um, and the three-dimensional wind field, which we get from uh, NOAA's National Weather Service, the kinds of models that are used to forecast weather um, and an eruption start time. So, but in order to model the Yellowstone eruption, we need to consider somehow the growth of this umbrella cloud. And the way that we did this in the model is that um, in the uppermost part of the, the nodes above the volcano, we actually calculate um, the growth of a circular cloud using a series of formulas that are dependent on the mass eruption rate. So a big eruption is going to have a, a cloud that grows more rapidly than a small one. And we add a radial wind field in, in those, uh, around those nodes to push ash out in, throughout that umbrella cloud. Um, and we add that radial wind field to the existing ambient wind field. So if it's a weak cloud growth, it's going to be overwhelmed by the ambient wind field and simply blow down wind. If it's a strong cloud growth, you'll see the umbrella cloud forming. It will overwhelm the existing wind field. Um, so the way we tested this was we, uh, we tried the Pinatubo eruption. These uh, are a series of cloud perimeters that were drawn from satellite data. 
So these are one hour intervals showing the growth of the peanut tubal cloud on June 15, 1991. And uh, cloud perimeters from the same times that were done from the model simulation. And for comparison, this is the, uh, the model without an umbrella cloud. So you can see that there is essentially no circular cloud that grows uh, unless you explicitly add it. So there are some more recent eruptions we can test this on. None of them are nearly as big as Pinatubo, but some of them have produced small, uh, small umbrella clouds. And one of the more spectacular ones was this one at Calbuco Volcano in Chile. April 22nd of 2015. So this is a photograph taken from Puerto Juarez, Chile, showing the amazing growth of this cloud. This is the rising column. And then the column is now feeding this umbrella cloud. And at the time that, of this eruption, uh, we were able to see the growth of this cloud. It, it caused major disruption to air traffic in South America for about a day. But we used this um, GOES-13 infrared satellite to get images every half hour. So these are images showing the growth of the cloud and the downwind movement of the cloud with time. And the red dots are lightning strikes. And we can see, for example, how the lightning strikes were also moving downwind with time. And with the model, so this is the model with the umbrella cloud and without. And you can see that with the umbrella cloud, it does seem to do a better job of at least producing the, reproducing the cloud shape than if we don't consider the umbrella cloud. Um, another example is from Kalut Volcano in Indonesia. Uh, this was uh, this uh, was an eruption that qu caused quite a stir in the aviation industry, not just because of the amount of ash that fell here at Jogjakarta Airport, but also because of flight um, from Perth to Jakarta flew into the umbrella cloud and suffered major engine damage, tens of millions of dollars of engine um, damage. A duration from days to a month. Uh, we chose a cloud height from 15 to 35 kilometers and the wind fields that were randomly chosen from historical patterns. It turns out that the wind field is of secondary importance for eruptions that are this big. Um, and so this is, these are, uh, simulations with the cloud and without the cloud for a three-day eruption. So you can see that during those first three days, you have the growth of an umbrella cloud that covers most of the North American continent. And then after those three days, once the cloud has, you can see, if you've got good eyes, you can actually see up here how many hours after the eruption start each of these frames is. But um, you, you can basically see how wide this cloud gets, how far uh, in all, pretty much in all directions it grows, and then how it disperses after the end of the three-day eruption. And I've, for these few dozen simulations we've done, we've calculated the thickness of the deposit around the country. So these are four examples of a three-day eruption uh, in January, in April, in July, and then in October. And the bottom line is that most of them look more or less like a bullseye. They clearly are modified to some extent by the existing wind field, but they are not the sort of typical deposits you'd expect to see from smaller eruptions where you have sort of a downwind ribbon of ash that's carried by the wind. These are more, more like bullseyes. And uh, if you're straining to look at these numbers, <coughs> So the pale yellow is one to three millimeters of ash, three to 10, 10 to 30, uh, 30 to 100, 100 to 300 millimeters, 300 to 1,000 and over a meter in this area of uh, western Wyoming and southern Montana. Um, so a lot of ash, of course, these are big eruptions. If we go to a week long eruption, the pattern's actually not that different. Uh, they still pretty much look like bullseyes, uh, somewhat modified by wind. Same with one month eruptions. They're um, a bit rounder, but still more or less look like bullseyes. If we try the same thing with no umbrella cloud, for three days, a week, a month, and a year, you can see that the ash is much more localized following whatever existing wind patterns there are. And of course, as we get to, say, a year-long eruption, we do see something more like a circular pattern, but it's, it's heavily truncated on the upwind side. So 
you can only, as, as soon as you get almost to the Oregon border, there's almost no ash in contrast to the other, um, the other maps I showed. The other thing is that these outlines, this brown outline and the red outline are outlines of the extent of ash from previous Yellowstone eruptions. And you can see that these extend quite a, quite a ways farther to the west than the ash deposits from from these, uh, at least from this, from this case. Um, so the main features, uh, the results with, with, with an umbrella cloud are not sensitive to seasons or duration. The umbrella cloud tends to drive ash up to 1,500 kilometers upwind, and ash is much more widespread with the umbrella cloud. So if we were to take one of these contour lines, like this 10 millimeter contour line and look at the area within it with the umbrella cloud, it's about five and a half million cubic kilom kilometers squared. It's about a tenth that for the case with no umbrella cloud. And uh, if you look at different the effects of cloud height, there's really not a whole lot of difference between a 15, 25, and 35 kilometer high cloud. Um, grain size matters a lot. And it's not something that's not easy to constrain. Um, we know that the size distribution of ash that erupts during these eruptions can vary. And even more variable is the process of, of ash. Once ash gets into the atmosphere, it starts to clump together and fall more rapidly than ash would as individual particles. And that process of clumping and ag or aggregation is not considered in this model or any other model currently in operation. We just don't understand the physics well enough to consider that. And it probably varies with atmospheric conditions. So the only way we can deal with that is to adjust the grain size until we get a pattern that resembles the pattern of ash distribution that we see in eruptions we've mapped. And so these are, these are grain size distributions that were taken from studies where we were able to match um, well-observed deposits. And you can see there still is quite a bit of variability, but if you look at, say, okay, how much could the, co the west coast get, it's probably still on the order of millimeters. It might be almost a centimeter in some cases um, with centimeters to tens of centimeters in the Upper Midwest uh, and Rocky and tens of more than tens of centimeters in the Rocky Mountain states. So there is variability, but there you can also derive from some broad generalizations. Um, so uh, the summary is: if you live on the coast, you're probably going to get millimeters, maybe centimeters in in, in in the Midwest and Southern Rocky Mountain states, and perhaps a lot more than that in, in, uh, in the upper Rocky Mountain states. But just to emphasize, these are events that we are probably not going to see in our lifetime. It's like once every couple, a few times every million years probably from Yellowstone. So it's not something that we're going to worry about. Um, so, uh, and the other takeaway points are that these results really aren't strongly affected by wind, surprisingly, or cloud height, or the seasons, or the duration of the eruption. Um, and so the, again, the, the main takeaway points are um, that these big umbrella clouds, which tend to occur during these eruptions, say, of the size of Pinatubo or, or larger, really change the way that ash is distributed from eruptions and distributed over a much wider area if you're upwind from an eruption this big, you may still get ash, unlike with smaller eruptions. And these big umbrella clouds reduce the ambient wind field to something that's of secondary importance. They also help explain how we can get ash so far west of uh, the known source of ash for the, the big Yellowstone events. So I'm just going to leave you with a photo taken looking over Lake Geneva with the 